boy who was playing baseball alone was heard saying, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. Ball in hand, bat in hand, tossed up the ball, swing and a miss. Strike one. Undaunted. He said the second time, I'm the greatest baseball player and the greatest baseball hitter who has ever lived. He tosses the ball up into the air, and he again takes a mighty swing. Strike two. He now carefully looks at his bat, and he looks at his ball. But for now, for the third time, as he tosses the ball up into the air, he says, I am the greatest hitter who has ever lived. And he took a strong swing. And once again, he missed strike three. He cried out, wow, strike three. I'm the greatest pitcher who has ever lived. <laughs> the southern kingdom of Judah is about to experience strike three. And let me explain that to you. Turn, first of all, to Ezekiel chapter 22, and I'll give you a little history lesson. Solomon followed being king after his father, David. We know that uh, Solomon ruled from approximately 970 through 930 B.C. He had a 40-year reign. But Solomon was not like Daddy because Solomon got allured by strange women, and God was going to take at least part of the kingdom away from Solomon's son, and that would be Rehoboam. So when Solomon dies, Rehoboam, his son, goes, and he tries to collect taxes. But the people up in the north of Israel weren't too pleased with that proposition. And they, if you will, turned against Rehoboam. So in other words, what was predicted came to pass. The kingdom was now rent in two. There would be a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom with separate kings. Up in the north... They didn't follow after God. They had a wicked king by the name of Jeroboam to begin. And he set up golden calves, if you will, up as far as Dan and down in Bethel. Why did he do that? Because the Jerusalemites, if you will, was the place that you would have worship. It was the place where all Jewish males were commanded three times a year to go and worship according to Deuteronomy 16, 16. So he set up a false system of worship. And in time, God said enough. And in 722 B.C., he sent in the Assyrians, and they came in and devastated the northern kingdom. Now, the southern neighbors are watching the southern kingdom of Judah, but they didn't learn any lessons. So in 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar recognized the name, the most powerful man on the planet at that time came in to attack the southern kingdom of Judah. That was strike one. He came in because the southern kingdom of D Judah had become idolaters. Years later, and by the way, let me just step back for one second. In 605 B.C., that is when Daniel was taken into captivity. Okay, 597 B.C., just a handful of years later, the southern kingdom is acting up again. So now Nebuchadnezzar sends his forces in a second time. By the way, that's the background for Ezekiel because that's when he was taken into captivity. So we have two strikes, if you will, against the southern kingdom of Judah. And you might want to ask, what were Judah's, uh, Judah's practices? What were they doing that, that was so displeasing to God? Well, let me walk you through a few of these. In Ezekiel 22, 3, they had committed murder, many murderers. They had committed idolatry. They worshipped foreign objects and foreign gods, Ezekiel 22, 3. They dishonored their parents, Ezekiel 22, 7. They disregarded the Sabbath, the day of rest. They did not regard, Ezekiel 22 and verse 8. They had gross immorality. Let me just read this to you because, if you will, when God speaks through Ezekiel, he doesn't mince his words. Uh, chapter 22, look at verse, verse 10 and then also verse 11 with me, please. 
In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. And another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. Gross immorality running rampant in the southern kingdom of Judah. And then you have the lap dance sisters. Come over to chapter 23 with me for just a moment, please. Ezekiel chapter 23, looking at verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. Who's the one mother? Israel because he's talking about the two daughters, the northern and southern kingdoms. Verse 3, they committed harlotry in Egypt. When they were in captivity, they started going after these strange gods. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were there embraced. Their virgin bosom was there pressed. Their names, Ahola, the elder, and Aholaba, her sister. They were mine. And they bore sons and daughters, as for their names, Samaria, by the way, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, was Ahola, and Jerusalem, capital of the southern, see, see how this works, everybody? The southern part of Israel is Aholaba. So, this is what you have going on in the southern kingdom, and you might say, was everybody corrupt? Well, let me just walk you through a few verses. Go back to chapter 22, pick it up in verse 26. 22:26 it says her priest have violated my law and profane my holy things. Who were the priest? They were the representatives from the people if you will toward God. They were the ones to offer sacrifices and prayers on behalf of the people. The corrupt. And now continue on verse 27. Her princes, that would be the political leaders in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Doesn't sound good, does it? Verse 28, her prophets, those who were to speak from God to the people, plastered them with untempered water. In other words, they whitewashed the walls. They were doing a cover-up, and how were they doing this? Seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. It's pretty bad, isn't it? It gets even worse because in verse 29, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppress the stranger. I don't know, when I read that, although we're dealing with the 6th century B.C., it sounds a lot like America to me today. But now in verse 30, and this is our text for today's message, I want to tell you what God is looking for, 2230. So, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Let's pray. Father, 6th century Judah, or here in America in the 21st century. Many things parallel. And Father, I know at times you must look down with such disgust at our nation because of the compromise in the pulpit and by the people alike. And those who name the name of Christ, Lord, are not living holy lives that are pleasing to you. So Father, I thank you that you are seeking for a person to stand in the gap. And I pray, Father, today we would come to understand and appreciate this text. And, Lord, that we would choose to be the person who stands in the gap, reaching out to a nation, reaching out to people, reaching out on behalf of you, Lord, so judgment wouldn't come. We ask you to work in a mighty way in our midst, in Jesus' name. Judah's ungodliness parallels America. Murder, idolatry, immorality, and lack of spiritual 
leadership. So what is God looking for in America today? And with that, may I give you prayer point number 13. God is seeking people of intervention. Very simple. God is seeking for people of intervention. Ezekiel says in verse 30, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. Notice, I sought. The theological word book of the Old Testament gives this description of the word sought. Our root basically connotes a person's earnest seeking of something or someone which exists or is thought to exist. Its intention is that its object be found or acquired. In other words, God is searching with the hope, with the ambition that this is what he is going to find. And what is he looking for? Someone we will see after his own heart. Turn with me first of all to 1 Samuel chapter 13, please. 1 Samuel chapter 13, as you're turning there, Saul is now king over Israel. Saul was the man that, if you will, represented what the other nations were like. He was head and shoulders above the people. And the Israelites wanted a king so they could be like the other nations, and God gave them just what they requested. And Samuel was the prophet, and he had told Saul, because they were doing battle with the Philistines. In seven days, I'm going to come as priest and offer a sacrifice. You wait for me. Samuel comes, but Saul acts hastily and offers the sacrifice himself, which he shouldn't do, because he was a king, but he most certainly wasn't a priest. And in verse 11, this is 1 Samuel 13, 11, and Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered for me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And notice Samuel's response. You have done foolishly. God wanted to establish Saul as king, but because of his disobedience to the word of God spoken through the prophet, he was going to be removed from being king. But what is God looking for? Verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord, and everybody give me those next two words, please. What? Yes, has sought. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. I can tell you this today, everyone, that God is looking through our congregation for a man or a woman who has a heart like himself. And you might go, what does it mean to have a heart like God? Well, let me give you the answer to that. Because as Paul was later preaching to the Israelites in 1 Samuel chapter 13, this is what he says in verse 22. I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, but listen carefully, who will do all my will. That's it. You got it? What is God looking for? A man or a woman who will say, I'm going to understand the will of God, and that's what I'm going to do, plain and simple. That's what God is looking for. Saul was not willing to do that, but David was. So God anointed David to be king. Turn with me now to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I just want to show you some passages to get you thinking about what God is looking for and actively looking for. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Let me set the stage for you. Asa is the king of the south, down in Judah. The king of the north, Baasha, is attacking down south. So now Asa has a choice. I can turn to the Lord and say, God, protect us from our northern neighbors, or he could go and find some reinforcements. So you know what he did. He goes to the king of Syria, Benadad, and if you will, he hires Benadad and makes an alliance with him in order to get protection. Isn't God enough? And as you are in 2 Chronicles 16, come down to verse 7 to pick this story up. Verse 7. 
And at that time, Hanani, the seer, the seer is a prophet. 1 Samuel 9, 9, seers were first called that name, later prophets. So he's a prophet. He came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. And then he gives him a history lesson of what he had even done himself in the past. Asa, verse 8. Were the Ethiopians and Elubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. See, in the past, when Asa got attacked, he turned to God, and what did God do? Gave him a miraculous deliverance. But what does he do this time? He goes up to his Syrian neighbors, and he thinks, our God's not big enough to help us. Verse 9, everybody. And this is a verse I hope you get etched in your mind. I hope you will look at verse 9 and have the audacity to come before God and say, I want to be that person. The person that God is seeking after to make a difference. Notice verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is, and catch the word, loyal to him. In other words, God's eyes are scanning the globe. He's looking for a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, who has a loyal heart to him. And you might say, what does it mean to be loyal? It's an interesting word, shalem. From the Hebrew. Does it sound familiar to you? Shalom? Shalom is peace. It means completeness, wholeness. This is the adjective. And it simply means that God is looking for someone whose heart is completely set on him. Someone, if you will, that is fully or wholly given his or her heart to the Lord. In other words, when you read the word of God and you know what you should do, you don't question it. You say, okay, that's the standard. I'm going to submit to it. And you get under the authority of God's word. That's all he wants from all of us. If you can only get to the place where you say, okay, Lord, whatever you show me, whatever you teach me from your word, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Then you become a man or a woman after God's own heart. He's looking for one loyal person. Let's continue in verse 9. See, he says to the king, in this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Why? Because Asa didn't trust in the Lord completely. Verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer. And what do you do with the messenger when you don't like the message? You shoot him. <laughs> that has been happening to God's spokespersons throughout the decades, throughout the centuries. How often when someone has spoken for God have they been martyred? In this case, he is shut up in prison. Now, come down, if you will, to verse 12. Same chapter, because I want to show you Asa's heart. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, notice what it says, he did not seek the Lord. In other words, God was seeking for a man who would be completely loyal to him. But Asa, later on, as he became somewhat decrepit, he had disease in his feet. Instead of turning to the Lord, he only sought the physicians. Now, there's wisdom in seeking out physicians because God will work through them. But he totally ignores the Lord. Come back with me, please, to chapter 22. But I hope as you look at that, you start to ask God to make you that man, that you start to ask God to make you that woman, someone that God can have total confidence in because you are completely committed to the Lord. That's what God is asking from each and every one of us. So Ezekiel is told that God wants the man to make a wall. Why a wall? A wall in ancient days spoke of security. Even today, if you go to Jerusalem, as I did in 1993, and you see the walls around the city, they're not the original walls. They were put up by uh, Suleiman the Great, by the way. But nonetheless, they were for protection. Remember the book of Nehemiah? What was Nehemiah's objective? What was it that he had to do in order to bring security to the nation Israel? He needed to build a wall. Why? It was for protection. 
God is looking for someone to build a wall, so in other words, he won't have to judge the southern kingdom, someone to intervene. Let me be very clear what intervention means. Oxford Dictionary says to come between so as to prevent or alter a result or course of events. God wants individuals given to intervention, but he's looking for particular individuals there, spiritual people. How many of us know somebody who needs an intervention? All of us do, don't we? All of us. I can start to go through a laundry list of people that I know that need an intervention. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 puts it this way. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. That word restore is very interesting. A related word is used in Matthew 4, which was used of mending nets. How do you mend nets? You don't go roughly on those nets. You're gentle. It was used in secular language of setting broken bones. You ever go to a doctor and you have something out of joint? <laughs> you want that doctor to be ever so gentle if you have anything dislocated, don't you, right? That's how we are to be to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't march in. We don't get in their faces. We don't just go, ah! We say, you know what? You've taken a misstep. The word of God says you're going in the wrong direction. I am here today as your brother or your sister in Christ to lovingly point you back in the right direction. I am here to help restore you. See, if you see anyone overtaken in the trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. And then it says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. See, you can't go out and correct other people if you've got that same issue going on in your own life. You know what I'm talking about? So before you go out and correct someone, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to correct yourself. And you need to make sure that you're right with God. And then it tells us in Galatians 6, 2, that this is how we fulfill the law of Christ. We have an obligation to one another. In other words, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Yes, we have been commissioned by the Lord himself to find those who are erring and seek to restore that person with an intervention. Not anybody wants you to step in with an intervention. <laughs> I've shown up in a lot of houses. I've gone to a lot of people. I've talked to a lot of folks over the years. And let me tell you, sometimes they're not ready for it, but it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to try. That is what we are called to. To do, And not only for those that are Christian who are meeting or missing the boat, so to speak, but we're also supposed to do it for unbelievers. Listen, if you will, to what Jude has to say on this. This is Jude verse 23. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Pull him out of the fire. Do we recognize, do we truly recognize that there are one of two places everyone will spend their eternity? Do we get it? It's heaven or it's hell. And you've heard me say it, but when you look up the Greek word Gehenna, it's used 12 times in the Greek New Testament. 11 out of the 12 times is Jesus himself who is talking about hell. He describes it as the place where the fire never goes out. He describes it as the place where the worm never dies. In other words, there's internal and external torment forever and ever and ever. That's hell. And people who don't know Christ, according to the authority of the word of God, when they die outside of Christ, they will be separated from his presence forever and ever and ever. He's the way. It's only one way. He's the truth. The Bible is truth. He is the life. He came not only to give physical life, but life eternal. And I give them eternal life, he says in John chapter 10. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The gift of eternal life. Our mission should be like Jesus. Do you understand that Jesus is always on a search and rescue mission? In Luke chapter 19... He goes into town, and there he sees Zacchaeus. 
And Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, right? We all know the tune. And where's Zacchaeus? And I love the guy. Can you imagine somebody today in a two-piece suit? They know someone important is coming to town, and they just climb up the telephone pole to get a look or climb up a tree. That's exactly what Zacchaeus did. Pretty humbling, huh? And then Jesus comes to him and says, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to your house today. And then it says at the end of the text, and I love this, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If your heart's aligned with God's heart, you're always looking for the lost and seeking opportunities to bring people to Christ. That's what we should be doing. If you believe the word of God, that there is a hell, and if just for one moment, if you will, we could have the blinders taken off and think about people dangling there forever. And by the way, Luke chapter 16 gives us what that is like. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? And the rich man didn't know the Lord, and he was just whooping it up, and he lived lavishly. He had his purple, he had his fine things, and he didn't know the Lord, and he died, and he was separated from God's presence. And then there was Lazarus, poor, but he knew the Lord. And Lazarus was taken to Abraham's bosom. You go, where is that? That's Abraham's bosom. That's heaven. Because Abraham was in heaven. And do you remember what the man in torment asked? Send Lazarus as if he's still in charge that he may take his finger and dip it into the water and touch my tongue, for I am in torments. That word is plural in this place. You know, I was brought up, there was heaven, there was hell, and there was purgatory. I can't find purgatory anywhere in the Bible, but I can find hell all over the place because Jesus talked about it often. And then there's heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. If you believe the word of God, and I do in every word in it, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he did that in six literal days. And on the sixth day, he created man and woman, and he put them in a garden in a perfect environment, and they were given, oh, such a stewardship. But because man's not satisfied with seeing Adam and Eve did what was disappointing and disrespectful to God. They broke the word of God. And they were told that in the day you sin, you shall surely die. It's death in the Hebrew, placed side by side, if you will, twice there. Why? To show that they were certainly going to die. And you go to Genesis chapter 5, and Adam lived so many years. And what happened, everybody? He died. The Bible is the only thing that gives me understanding about what's going on in this world. Because I understand sin, I understand the nature of sin, I understand it leads to death, but I also understand that there can be a rescue. And that is when Christ came to this earth, that's his intervention, to lay down his life. He didn't go to the cross to be a good moral example. You know, I was in high school, I was um, junior year, playing one of the best tennis players in the county. He picked me up in his Cadillac. I still had a bicycle at that time. I was really in the bucks. And uh, I remember witnessing to him after the tennis match, after he whooped me thoroughly, by the way. Really wasn't a fun day on the tennis court. And he goes, how do you know Jesus wasn't just a good man? It's a good question. It's not an option we have. Jesus Christ so very clearly claims to be God. In John 8, 58, he says, before Abraham was, I am I am is a statement of a deity. He's saying, I've always existed. And how do we know that everybody understood what he was saying? They picked up stones to kill him. And then in John chapter 10, he says, I and the Father are one. One of the same essence. They're made out of that God stuff. And what did the Jews? It says they picked up stones again to kill him. So you got three options with the Lord Jesus Christ. Give you three L's. He was a liar. Because he claimed to be God, and he wasn't, and he was telling anybody untruths. Or he was a lunatic. He was deluded. He really believed he was God. Or he is a Lord. I believe he is Lord. And there's going to come a day that every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And I can tell you this, my friend. You can bow now, or you can bow later when you're forced to bow. When I heard the gospel message and I understood, hey, no purgatory, heaven or hell, I want to go to heaven. I want to be with Jesus forever. I didn't understand the whole deal, but I can tell you this. 
I didn't want to be tormented in any flame forever and ever and ever. Jesus had intervened in order that I could be saved. Now, I am sent that I might be the one, if you will, that is the extension of the Lord Jesus Christ to try to rescue people in this way. So what do we see? Number one, or prayer point number 13, God is seeking people of intervention. And then number 14 with our prayer points, God is seeking for people of intercession. Intercession. Get this, everybody. Prayer is how God works. It is. Go from Genesis to Revelation and just start to highlight all the references to prayer. I did that last year. I got a highlighter and I read Genesis through Revelation. Every reference where there was prayer made, I highlighted it. I highlighted it. Now I'm going back through reading my Bible and I'm writing all those things down this time. Extraordinary how God operates through the realm of prayer. Because what is it that God is telling Ezekiel is looking for? For someone to stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. Stand in the gap. That's prayer posture. Remember when Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be wiped out? Boy, and I'll tell you something. Where have we gone with our country? Where have we gone? The very things, you know, even think of the name Sodom, Sodomy, in a state emphasizing gay marriage in a country you know the boy scouts made to stand against homosexuality that they didn't want their leaders being professed homosexuals and our own president says no that's not right i'm going what is going on god in the beginning created them male and female and god forbid that pope priest president stand up and say what God has said is true isn't true any longer, or it doesn't apply to us. I don't get it. I'm telling you, I don't get it. But here you've got Abraham. And let me just tell you all something. I'm, I'm just telling you as it is. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're Hispanic. I don't care if you're Asian. It doesn't matter. There's not all these races. There's one race. <gasps> That's right, the human race. We all come from one blood, is what I'm told in Acts chapter 17, one blood. We all come from Adam and Eve, so therefore truly we are one people. The standards that are set are not set by just white, blacks, Hispanics, or Asians. They are, if you will, established by a holy God. And I want to invite you to do something, align our hearts with his heart. Because so often the Lord Jesus Christ made the bad guy the good guy and the good guy the bad guy. In Luke chapter 10, we had the Samaritan. And what do we know the story as? The good Samaritan. They weren't any good Samaritans. They were half-breeds. They were half-Jewish. They were half-Assyrian. Remember the captivity of the northern kingdom, 722? Jews mingled with the Assyrians. And you know what traditional Jews did? They went around Samaria. Wow. So who does Jesus make? The good guy. The bad guy from Jewish culture. So I trust that God is working on your hearts. And I mean this from the depth of my heart. I hope he's working on your heart to understand they're one people. One people. One race. The human race. We all come from Adam. And this is so biblical that it's the only thing that makes sense to me. So whether, you know, it's the clan or whether you got the black power movement over here and everybody's abusing the scripture, if you will, trying to put other people down. Understand this, Jesus died for all people. Can I get an amen with that? Jesus died for all people. And if our heart's not lined up with his heart, then we're going to look down on other people for various reasons. One standard, my friends, and I trust you embrace it, the word of God. Here's Abraham. And he's praying to see how many righteous people there are in Sodom. Starts at 50, comes down to 45, 40, 30. Man, he's working his way down. But listen to what it says in Genesis 18, 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood, posture of prayer, before the Lord. What was he doing? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was interceding. For those cities now understand this my friends there are times when wickedness is so bad 
God's going to judge. Nothing's going to stop it. Are we at that point in America? You know, you go back to 1973 with Roe versus Wade. You look at the millions and millions and millions and millions of babies that are aborted, and we don't think all that blood is on our hands as a nation, that somehow we can just overlook these things. It's murder. God's very clear on that. In Jeremiah 15, verse 1, Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stand, see the idea, the prayer posture, stand before me, yet my mind could not be favorable toward this people. In other words, God was going to judge the southern kingdom of Judah for all the wickedness it was going to do. And it didn't matter if you had godly men such as Moses or Samuel praying for them. But may I ask you, how do you know? if your intervention and your intercession won't move the heart of God. Psalm 106, would you turn there? I want you to understand the severity of this, my friends. You might be people's hope. You might be the nation's hope. God has used an individual at times to change a nation. Prayer does awesome things, and I trust that you will start to believe in that. And my friends, there comes a time when you need to start getting on your faces before God and confessing the sin of our nation and asking God's mercy, but asking also that God will give us a revival, that his standard of the word of God would become what becomes important to us. In Psalm 106, come down to verse 19. The psalmist has given a little history lesson. He says, they made a calf at Horeb. Remember on Mount Sinai? Moses is up getting the, the law, and what are the people doing down below? You're all adults. They were having an orgy. Wow. They're having an orgy. And they worshiped the molden image. What a slap in God's face. God had delivered them supernaturally out of Egypt. Now what are they doing? They're worshiping a stupid golden calf. That's what's going on. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. God was going to wipe them out. <laughs> and here's Moses. When God said that he was going to wipe them out, had not Moses, his chosen one, did what, everybody? Give me that word, stood before him in the breach. And by the way, I was having my devotions in Deuteronomy this morning. I read chapter 9, and do you know that God was also going to strike Aaron dead? Had not Moses interceded for him? Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse, I think it's 20 that God was so angry because Aaron had made that golden calf when Moses was up on the mount that God was going to strike him dead. And what did Moses do? He prayed for Aaron, and God spared his life. You know, and I'm looking, and I'm going, hmm, someone is standing in the gap. We have too many people standing in the cesspool encouraging Christians to join them instead of having Christians standing in the gap saying, you know what, you need to come out of that lifestyle. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I see it all the time. We got somebody hanging out and going, hey, you know, hey, girl, hey, guy, come hang out with us. Let's go do something really corrupt together. And if there's a group of us, we'll feel ever so better. And if you're righteous, we want to change you because you make all of us feel kind of tainted, kind of soiled. So why don't you come join us? But what we need to be seeing are those men and women, those young men and women saying, you know what, I'm heading out to Bible study. Why don't you come with me there? I'm going and spend some time in prayer and just hanging out with my Christian friends, doing Christian kind of things. Why don't you come with me there? Who is standing in the gap for them? Can I tell you all something? I mean this. It doesn't take much to be cheap. It doesn't take much to defile yourself. It doesn't take much to be like everybody else out there. We see it all the time. Everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about, don't we? But it really takes guts, Christian guts, to stand up and go, I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to be different. I'm not going there. Moses stood in the gap, and it saved lives. How serious is this? Turn to 1 John chapter 5, 
and you think about your Christian friends who aren't doing what they should be doing. 1 John chapter 5, and I want you to think about the ones who God has redeemed, and yet now they're still out playing the game. They're still out doing those things, and they know exactly what they're doing is wrong. They know the fornication. They know the adultery is not God's standard, but yet they're playing the game. They're playing the game. Could God strike such a person who knows better and isn't choosing to do what's right? Could God take such a life just like this? Oh, you better believe it. You better believe it. Don't you ever presume upon God. You go to Leviticus 10 and you see Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the priest. And they offered a strange sacrifice. Actually, it says that they were drunk. If you read a text carefully, God says, no more drinking when you come in to serve me. And God struck them dead. And then you had Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. And what are they doing? They're playing the, the sham game. They're pretending to be something that they're not. And God bumped off one and he bumped off the others, professing believers. I don't think we understand the severity that God could take our lives in a heartbeat when we compromise him. When we take our Christian bodies and make them members of a prostitute, if you will, that compromises Christ so greatly. In 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 16, and let me explain this to you. You've got to give you a few Greek words here to kind of give you a little better understanding, but track with me, everybody. If anyone sees his brother, that's speaking of a Christian, got it? If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death. Now, you might go, okay, how do I know it doesn't lead to death? And I'll give you the answer. He's still alive or she's still alive. If that sin leads to death, you'll know it. You know why? You'll be at their funeral probably in three days. If you see a brother sinning a sin which is not leading to death, in other words, God hasn't chosen to take their life yet. Notice the next few words, he will ask. That's the Greek verb, iteo. It's used of a petitioner, if you will, coming to someone greater than himself or herself. In other words, it's a lesser coming to a greater. So, here you are. You know certain Christians are right now off the hook. You know what they're doing. You know their activity. And you understand because Christ had claimed them, that they are in danger that God could take him or her home at a moment. I saw this early on. I saw this early on. I was 18. I knew a Christian man. He was Christian. I know he's Christian. Got engaged in a relationship he should not have been in. The relationship went south, and he went and he blew his brains out. People go, well, you know, suicide, the unpardonable sin. It's not the unpardonable sin. It's not what the Bible says in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 12. God will take people home. I've preached funerals that way. It's hard to get up and preach when someone is 18 or 20 and they were out on a drinking binge and they came to a highway and maybe didn't stop for that stop sign or didn't slow down enough or whatever and is dead. I'll tell you something, it's no fun preaching a funeral like that. The sin leading to death. Well, let's continue here. And he will give life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. Why? Because you've interceded and God's changing that person. There is sin leading to death. And I do not say that he should, and notice the next word, pray about that. First of all, how do you know that sin led to death? I'll tell you how that person's dead. What does it mean there that you should not pray? That's a different Greek verb here. It's erotao. And this verb means that you don't come to God as an equal with God and say, why did you do it? See, once God does it and he says that person needs to come home, then we're not in a position to question God because God always knows what's best. What's the implication? What's God looking for? I'll tell you what he's looking for. People with holy lives that are willing to intervene and willing to intercede. I wonder how many Christians are still alive today because someone has prayed for them even when they've been knuckleheads, even when they've been out fornicating, even when they've been out committing adultery, even when they've been lying, cheating, and stealing. And you have some Christian like Abraham, if you will, praying for Lot when Lot was playing the knucklehead, and yet God spared his life. I wonder how many are still alive because God has honored the prayer of the person who has come 
as an intercessor. And now let me give you the sad news as we wrap up our passage in Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. God was seeking for a man to stand in a gap for them that I should not destroy it. Catch the words, but I found no one. Is that heartbreaking? It should be. You know what? Strike three occurred on the southern kingdom of Judah. And in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came in with a great force, devastated, raised Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. Read the book of Lamentations and you understand what God did to Jerusalem. That was strike three for them. So what does God want of us? I'll tell you what he wants. Number one, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've been playing the, the, the game, pretending that you're a Christian, but it's only in name only, the word Christian really means a little Christ. It's someone who truly understands who Jesus Christ is. He wasn't just a moral man. He is the Son of God. He is the one that laid his life down and he took your sin upon himself at the cross. And if you're sitting there and you're real honest with yourself and the Spirit of God is bringing you conviction, you know how much of a sinner you are. You know what you've done. I know what I've done. And how much better does God know it? May I encourage you to stop playing a game and go, yeah, I'm a Christian. When you know in your heart of hearts you haven't believed in Christ. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 7, there's going to come a day I'm going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Don't play the name only game. A child of God is one who understands fully who Jesus is. Jesus is God who died for the sin of the world. He took your sin and my sin upon the cross. Why? He became our substitute. Think of it, my dear friend. Christ died for your sin. He had never done anything wrong. But like the illustration that Jesus gives to Nicodemus, it was like when the nation of Israel disobeyed God and God sent fiery serpents in and bit the people. And they cry out to Moses and say, we repent. God says, Moses, take a pole and put a bronze or a brazen serpent on it. And when anyone looks up to it, that person will be saved. So in other words, they got bit by the snake. They looked up. They were saved. Christ went to the cross that you might be saved. He went there to take your sin upon himself. And can I have you right now just bow your head? Can I have you close your eyes, everybody?